Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar on vaccines. My name is uh, Frances Godia from Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, and uh, I'm I'm very glad that you could uh, you could join. This is uh, an effort that uh, Expokimia uh, Bio uh, is doing in these uh, difficult times. We are uh, all living around the globe. Uh, Expokimia had to um, uh, reshape a little bit his program of the uh, of the meeting. The meeting, as you can see on the screen now, is going to be on uh, 14 to 18 September 2021. This is going to be the physical event of Expokimia. But before we get into that date, uh, Expokimia and especially uh, regarding biotechnology uh, stream uh, how, had the um, uh, initiative to prepare a series of webinars you can see in the screen on various aspects of biotechnology, everything from uh, vaccines to a uh, green deal, agro-food, bio-based industries, cosmetics, the different sectors involved in, uh, in biotechnology. And um, you see in the screen the dates where are going to happen. And uh, it's certainly uh, almost an obligation from this series of Expokimia Bio to start uh, having a webinar dedicated to vaccines. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, vaccines are going to play a major role in the recovery from the from the pandemics, and it's uh, it's uh, very appropriate that today we can we can have uh, uh, a selected group of uh, experts that are going to to deal with the development of vaccines, with a special focus on on COVID certainly. Uh, in, in this in this in this time of uh, pandemics and this in this uh, uh, framework of uh, of the webinars of Expokimia uh, Bio, as you can see in the screen, we have uh, five uh, uh, speakers. Um, all of them are going to make the effort to present in a very uh, reduced time uh, uh, a highlight of uh, different uh, aspects of the of the vaccines. Uh, they are all of them uh, uh, very reputed uh, scientists and, uh, and, um, and, and experts in, in their areas. We are, we are starting with uh, uh, Dr. Julia Vergara from, uh, uh, from Cresa Irta, uh, covering the more uh, 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 biologically and, uh, and fundamental aspects of uh, virus and vaccines, etc. This will be followed, uh, uh, followed by Dr. Margarita del Val from uh, CSIC, talking about the vaccine development for emergent diseases, as we have uh, now. We will then move to Adolfo Lopez Cruz, uh, who is working for uh, Zendal uh, Group. Uh, is, this is a is a vaccine uh, manufacturing company, and uh, he will be touching more in the aspects related on the industrial manufacturing of vaccines, followed by uh, Dr. Uh, Sol Ruiz. Um, he is working with the uh, La Agencia Española de Medicamento, and uh, Sol Ruiz is going to cover all the regulatory aspects that we know are very basic in the delivery of uh, vaccines um, and the uh, vaccination programs to our uh, population. And finally, Dr. Philippe Alexander Gilbert is going to uh, touch a little bit specifically on uh, RNA vaccine manufacturing, uh, especially uh, dedicated to reaching low and medium income uh, countries, which is certainly also very relevant uh, he's working for the Villa Melinda Gates Foundation, and, and today we see how relevant is that vaccination uh, spread all over, all over the globe. So um, I, am not, uh, I am not going to spend any other minute uh, uh, presenting or introducing each one of the speakers. 
the speakers will be making their presentation uh, one after another. This is going to be like 12 minute uh, short uh, presentations. And after that, we will follow with uh, a Q&A uh, session with uh, all the speakers. So if, we, if you want uh, to, 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 pre to present your questions, uh, you have to use the, the question tab in, the, in, the, in your computers. And, uh, and then we will grab the questions and we will take all of them, uh, if providing there is enough time, we will take all of them together at the end of the five, uh, at the end of the five uh, presentations. Yeah. So we go first into the individual um, uh, presentation of each one of the experts. We just follow all the flow we have prepared for you, going more from the basics into the uh, uh, into the access. And after that, we will start with the questions. So without further introduction is the time for uh, Julia Vergara. Julia, thank you for accepting to, to present. And I obviously would like also to thank the rest of the speakers. You are very busy people, and it's great that you can dedicate some time to disseminate your work on, uh, on, on vaccines. Your time, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, Kiku, I'm trying to share my screen now. So, yeah, there we are. You, okay, Perfect. excellent. So, yeah, first of all, yeah, thank you very much uh, to the organizing committee to let me present a little bit the update on COVID-19 vaccines. So it's a really honor and pleasure to, to share at least a virtual table together to these excellent ex uh, speakers. As Frances said, I will try to summarize a little bit because we have a uh, few time and just to let you know uh, I am a researcher at Irta Cresa so I'm mentioning some of the companies but I don't have any uh, conflict of interest with all of them so all what I will present will be scientific results that are appearing day by day uh, related to, this, to these vaccines. Not working. Wait a sec. Now, okay. So I just to start with a little bit of the global situation of COVID-19 because, as you know, this changed day by day. So to date, we we have more than 111 million uh, cases related to COVID-19 confirmed cases, and. Uh, more than 2,475,000 uh, associated deaths. Um, this timeline is, is just to, to let you know uh, or to summarize how the things uh, went during the last year, more or less. So by the end of 2019, the first report of a cluster of pneumonia in Wuhan in China was reported. And after... Um, after discarding all, uh, some respiratory disease, such as influenza, even SARS-CoV, the original one. So the, the researchers, they, they claim that this was a new coronavirus. And in fact, uh, at the beginning of January, the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was uh, published by a group of, of Chinese researchers. And a week later, a group in Germany, led by uh, Professor Drosten and, and Korman also, uh, they already uh, have developed a, a diagnostic tool, a PCR. So with this rapid sequence of the virus and then they developed this tool. And by the end of January, the WHO declared the COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern. And, only, and, and then one, one and a half months later, the WHO declared officially a pandemic. And by the same time, the first uh, clinical trials begin and two months later the first uh, so the first vaccines enters in phase two and, and three clinical trials you can imagine this is a, a really fast fast uh, development of vaccines and uh, by the end of the year well at the beginning of November in fact 
uh, we start receiving the first efficacy data from the first candidates. In this case, he has said Pfizer, but, but also from other candidates. And by the end of last year, uh, the first vaccine uh, went to the market. Okay, this all, uh, this all uh, speed up of the development of vaccines uh, were possible or are possible, of course, because of the huge uh, investment in this field nowadays, not only money, but also all the effort from the scientists, but also because all the extensive work on MERS coronavirus and also other coronaviruses that have been performed before the 2020. Um, in fact, if we think no, about the normal development of a COVID vaccine, um, it is a step-by-step uh, step sequence. So here you see the traditional vaccine development. So we first have the preclinical uh, assays and then we enter in the clinical assays, the phase one, phase two, and then the phase three. And once we know the safety and efficacy of the candidate, uh, it, it starts the manufacture process, the approval of this candidate, and of course the distribution. So this takes quite a lot of years. What happened in this case, in this pandemic situation, is that the several steps have been performed in parallel. So the preclinical studies have been done in parallel with the clinical ones. And what is also really important, uh, some of the, the pharmaceutical companies, they were manufacturing the product even before knowing if, if they were efficacious uh, or not. So just to earn some time. Of course, it's really important, this phase four post-marketing surveillance, uh, it's uh, extended a lot, so just to check for the side effects. The vaccines are always under, under uh, control. So this is a summary of the vaccine's products uh, in development. Last update was the, yeah, on Tuesday. This is the last update that I have. And then we have uh, approximately 182 vaccines in the preclinical development and 73 in the clinical development. And this is important because, at least traditionally, because here the percentage maybe changed a little bit, but traditionally only 7% of vaccines in the preclinical studies succeed and move to the clinical trials. And about them, uh, approximately 20% of them has chance to succeed. So it's important to have that amount of vaccines. From these 73 candidates, um, there are several strategies that have been used to perform or to develop this, this vaccine candidates. Here you can see some, uh, you can see them. The most or the widely used is to use the protein subunit. But of course, we all know no, the RNA-based vaccine that, for example, are the Moderna and Pfizer uh, are based on that type of platform or the viral vector um, vaccine such as AstraZeneca and as well as others and in fact I really like this this graph is the same no here we have the different type of vaccines for example on the top of the left DNA based vaccines uh, and then we have some of the examples no Sanofi and Inovio they are working with this type of of platforms and then we have the Pfizer, Moderna, Curevac, they are working with uh, RNA-based vaccines. Uh, or also on the top on the right, we have the viral vector vaccines that they use no, uh, another uh, virus, a harmless virus, to carry a gene of special interest and then deliver this product. So AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, also CanSino Bio, they are using this type of, of platform. Uh, so this is a little bit just to summarize. I, I am not going to enter in detail into, into it, all these types because this is a complete uh, seminar. And then uh, talking about numbers, how many vaccination doses have been administrated worldwide? So more than uh, 216 uh, million doses have given uh, from around more than 100 locations. And I think it's really interesting well, all the talks will cover different aspects, and the last one by Philip will talk also a little bit about some of the locations that maybe are difficult to cover. Here you can see that some, some of the, the locations that are given more doses per, per 100 uh, habitants, for example, Gibraltar, Israel, they are uh, really efficient on, on, on that. And here, if we take the example of Israel, UK, 
US and the European Union. No, this is the cumulative vaccination dose. You can see uh, Israel is uh, giving a lot of doses, and then uh, the rest you have here uh, European Union with approximately 7% of this percentage. Also, these are the cumulative uh, cases or doses, sorry, uh, per 100 habitants. And then what I was telling a little bit, what's uh, really important is that the advanced economies, I don't really like this concept, but I think that we all know what that's in need, the advanced economies are ahead on this COVID vaccination. If you see here in, in pink, we have the emerging and developing countries. So uh, they are vaccinated quite a few, especially if we compare no, with the US, UK, Israel, and, and all the advanced uh, economies. And this, we need to solve this, this problem, how to reach uh, all the countries. In terms of efficacy, we all know that the vaccines that are administrated are really efficacy. Here is the example, uh, efficient, sorry, here's the example of the mRNA-based vaccines. We have on the left Moderna vaccine and on the right Pfizer vaccine. So, and in blue, the placebo group and in pink, the, the ones that recite the vaccine. So we, we uh, saw that the placebo group overtake the vaccine group over the first dose. These are the cases, the COVID cases. So they are really, it's really good in protecting both vaccines. They are really good, especially in the severe cases. The same happens for the, for the vector-based uh, vaccine. This is the AstraZeneca one. So it's really protecting even after the first dose. So after one and after both doses, and especially, especially when talking about protecting uh, severe cases of COVID-19. But of course, the, the great question here is what about the efficacy against new variants? Uh, a lot of studies have been done and are performed day by day uh, to, to study this. Here is an example of uh, Dr. Kramer and collaborators. Uh, here they are, uh, they check the neutralization against this, this mutant, against this variant by the Pfizer vaccine, and they could detect no, that, that uh, this variant can be, can be blocked uh, by, the, by the vaccine. And similar studies, as I put here on the right, have been performed on the same, on the same way. What happened? That, for example, uh, more studies need to be performed because it has been observed that for the variant B1351, uh, so the South African one known, um, with Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, the neutralization titer decreases. Uh, it's reduced, as you can see here. Here we have the wild type uh, or the current strain and then this variant. And then uh, some mutations have been detected that they, they, they confer the virus or the virus to escape from monoclonal antibodies. So just to finish, um, I want to raise some important questions that needs to be answered. Of course, uh, the last one that you have seen here is against new variant strains. A lot of efforts are being done to study the the vaccines and if they protect against new variant strains and how to improve this. But of course, we need to study all these things. For example, also really important, try to identify an immunologic correlation of protection. This is also very important. And, and well, all these, no, on uh, the effect of vaccines, no, if it protects against severe COVID in elderly uh, subjects, but also in children. So all these questions are, are, let's say, key questions now to develop new vaccines and to, uh, to improve the, the ones that are in the market. Yeah, here just uh, to mention no, that Catalin Carico is the vice president of BioNTech, and I think it's a really important woman nowadays because she has been working with uh, mRNA vaccines since several years ago, and after fighting a lot, uh, to trying to demonstrate her ideas, and I think that this was her year. So, and just to finish, this is uh, at Irta Cresa. We are working with several companies, but uh, mainly in the frame of a consortium, the Civic Consortium. So, we are working together with our hospitals, IRSI Kasha, IGTP, and also with Barcelona Supercomputing Center. We have the crowdfunding of Yome Corono. 
and also we are founded by Grifols and by La Generalitat de Catalunya. And as uh, Kiku said, uh, I will be open to questions at the end of the, all the sessions. Kiko, I think you are, we cannot listen you. Sorry. So thank you very much, uh, um, Julia. And I'm now going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Margarita Del Val for her presentation. OK, hello. Nice to meet you all. Um, so I'm going to, to elaborate on what Julia was presenting. And uh, she was saying that um, one of the important things to uh, to find out during this uh, period uh, after the vaccines have been already in the market is um, uh, the immune correlates of uh, protection. They are protecting, but we want to know how is this protection mediated. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit on how do vaccines work. So we know that the immune system looks at viruses at a different way that, than we do. We classify viruses as RNA or DNA viruses or with envelope or no, not envelope as those that are respiratory viruses or, or maybe those that are transmitted through the blood. But the immune system looks at the tasks that it has to do with the viruses and it looks at what it has to eliminate. So when the virus infects um, our body, it, it does so only because it needs to replicate. It doesn't want to make us ill or to uh, kill us at all. Uh, the only thing it, it has to do is to start replicating in the, in the cells of our body and produce enough virus so that it is released to the extracellular medium. And this release virus can be then transmitted to other human beings and get infected and then get more replication in them. So the way the immune system looks at this is that it has to eliminate both the infected cells that in some cases are very massively killed by the infection and in some cases are only uh, producing a virus without any uh, cytopathic effect to the cells. So it has to uh, eliminate both the infected cells at any stage and the circulating viral particles that can uh, lead to transmission to other human beings. So for that, uh, we have the adaptive immune response, which is uh, triggered as soon as we see something that is strange, so that we have never seen before, and that is damaging. So as soon as there's some damage, and for example, caused by some virus, we have everywhere in the body, we have some cells of our immune system that are called antigen-presenting cells. These antigen-presenting cells, what they do is that ingest this virus, they take it up, and they process and present it to uh, adaptive immune lymphocytes. And so we have the helper uh, CD4 T lymphocytes, we have the cytotoxic CD8 T lymphocytes, and we have the B lymphocytes. These B lymphocytes, when they get activated by this process of antigen presentation, they produce the antibodies. So the antibodies are the humoral component of our immunity. And what they do is that they uh, block and neutralize the virus and thereby prevent it from being infectious and prevent the cells from getting infected at all. We also have the cellular immunity and the cellular immunity is mediated by the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And what they do is to destroy infected cells because as I showed you, the infected cells are the true virus factories. So when they are uh, fully destroyed, you also limit virus replication. So both type of actions contribute to clearing infection and may contribute to protection from a given infection. It is really important that we have a good immune memory because these lymphocytes that have been uh, uh, trained to recognize something that is strange to our bodies as the virus, they live for a long time and they um, should be uh, conferring immunity and protection for a very long time. The important thing is that immunity is best when uh, the memory T cells are trained exactly in the same uh, body location as they are expected to, to work. 
So for this purpose, if we are thinking of a respiratory virus that it has to be eliminated in the respiratory tract, please remember that we are not starting with that because it's not the fastest track to development of vaccines. But please remember that one of the best uh, routes of inoculation of a vaccine will be intranasally. So we have a number of vaccines and Julia was referring to them. Um, some of them are viral vectors and, and these type of vaccines behave exactly the same concerning antigen presenting cells as, as the virus itself because they are taken up and uh, start the whole immune system and we have this type of vaccines for example. Uh, all of those that we have right now are based on adenovirus vectors and uh, these are the AstraZeneca, uh, the Sputnik vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson that, that is coming soon and they are all uh, quite efficacious and they all follow the same mechanism. We also have, of course, the genetic vaccines that were the fastest. It doesn't mean that they are going to be the best, but they were the fastest and they are very efficacious, they are very good, and they are based on just pure RNA. The RNA doesn't have the possibility of getting uh, taken up by the cells in the same way, so it is delivered by lipid nanoparticles that are uh, getting close to the antigen presenting cells and they are delivered directly, the RNA is directly delivered into the cytoplasma of the antigen presenting cell, the spike protein is translated, processed and the immunity is, um, is induced in the, in the same way as it would happen with a viral vector or with the virus itself. And this is the mechanism that Pfizer is proposing for its uh, vaccine. So how is the immune system uh, reacting to these vaccines? And here is the example of Moderna. Uh, what happens is that you have, let's look at the elderly people, you have the first dose of vaccine and you have some uh, antibodies being made and not very many of them. You have the second dose and then you have a very strong boost in the number of functional antibodies that are being prepared by, the, by, by your immune system. Uh, I mean neutralizing antibodies, those that kill the virus infection, that kill the, the virus infectivity. And the boost is uh, from 10 to 50 fold depending on, on different vaccines uh, with the second dose. So it is important to get the second dose because you will get many more antibodies and that's, that is the way the immune system works. The second dose is much better than only one and it's, it's not just twice as many exposure to the, to the vaccine, it is, it is really a huge difference. So with time, as happens with all antibody response, the antibody response declines within months, it goes down, and still after uh, these four months, it is clear that uh, they are still in the, in the level that is found in the serum of convalescent patients. We still don't know whether they are as protective as natural infection, which is quite protective concerning clinical symptoms, and we don't know about the duration of the vaccines. The RNA vaccines also elicit a cellular immune response, and here I have the data from Pfizer as an example. And they elicit the helper T lymphocytes that regulate all others, and the type of helper lymphocytes that are elicited upon vaccination is of the type that produces interferon gamma and interleukin-2. This is the type uh, T helper 1, which is very uh, Margarita, I think you are muted. You, you tell me I was muted for the whole time? I hope not. <laughs> so anyway, what we have is that um, we have the... Um, the two types of um, um, effector mechanism, we have the cellular immunity and the humoral immunity, and just on to how to develop uh, vaccines. So the, the T lymphocytes, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, they can recognize any epitope from any protein of the virus. And here we have the whole genome of this SARS coronavirus 2. And from the whole genome, 
you can see that there are a number of dots. You can see that there's recognition of epitopes from many different proteins, okay? On the other hand, if you look at the humoral immune response, the, hu the antibodies are restricted to recognizing what is exposed on the surface of the virus particle, because they can only access the virus particle from the outside. And these exposed uh, regions of the protein, they are located, in the case of the coronavirus, on the S protein, only on the S protein, and they tend to be more variable. And that's actually what we are seeing with the variants that are, um, that are surging all over the, the world. So what happens, this is what happens with infection. With infection, you have uh, uh, an immune response that goes to the exposed proteins by antibodies as a cellular immune response that recognizes all viral proteins. What happens when you have a vaccine that is based on the S protein alone? Well, the humoral immunity will be exactly the same. You will have a focus on the S protein, but the antibody, but the, by, by the cellular immunity, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes will be limited in the types of epitopes that they can recognize. So they, there will be only a limited cellular immune response. On the other hand, if you have a vaccine that has more proteins than only the S protein, you will have a more a broader cellular immunity and this will contribute to protection because especially because this this uh, immunity is recognized in any epitope especially also conserved epitopes so if we are starting to get problems with variants of the virus that are developing too many variations around the the, uh, the, the antibody recognition site besides uh, modifying the protein according to the variants it would be good to have vaccines in the pipeline coming in the pipeline that have more viral proteins included as well. And then finally, what, what the vaccine does, what, how, how, how are they working concerning a human being and how are they working concerning a population? We know that the vaccines are going to stimulate our immune memory, that they are biological medicines because they, are, they have components of the microorganism. They are usually preventive. And we know that what they do is instead of training the immune system with, uh, with something like natural infection that poses a risk of death, what they are doing is to train our immune system as effectively or even better than the natural infection, but with very low risk. They can prevent a number of the actions caused in our body by an infection, from infection to symptoms to death and even to transmission uh, of, the, of the pathogen. We know that if we have, uh, right now, what we have is vaccines that protect against disease. So they, we know that they were developed to protect against symptoms, whether mild, severe, or even from deaths. This is what was uh, uh, searched for during the clinical uh, assays. However, if we have good vaccines, either that because we are lucky or because we have been um, um, more careful in the design, we will have vaccines that also prevent infection. Uh, that is, that if the vaccinees are exposed to the virus, will not replicate the virus in their nasopharynx. And of course, if there's no replication of the virus, there will be no, no possibility of transmission to other human beings. And so these type of vaccines are better because they may be able to control not only disease in the vaccinees, but also to control the pandemic. That is to bring uh, the society to, uh, back to uh, normal life. What do we know right now? We know that the vaccines that we have are, of course, very safe. Safety is, has a, a very strong profile, uh, both of them. And we know that they, they prevent symptoms. We will know very soon as, as data from, uh, from, uh, from, from vaccination in different countries are made available that they protect from deaths. But what we know right now already is that they do not fully prevent from infection. So vaccinees can replicate the virus in their nasopharynx. They can be tested PCR positive, actually, or antigen positive. So they replicate the virus. Uh, so protection is partial, it's not complete. Pro protection is not sterilizing immunity. And therefore, uh, the possibility exists that the vaccinees may transmit the virus to their contacts. It is still not known, but the possibility is there. So, and with that, I leave you. Uh, we hope that we can get um, uh, that with these vaccines, that the partial protection is good enough to 
somehow slow down transmission and we hope that new vaccines that we need uh, will come and that they will also uh, confront really the pandemic without having to vaccinate everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce or to give the floor to Adolfo uh, Lopez Cruz. Adolfo, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for all the all the all the webinar uh, to share with with us this this uh, webinar with us. And I am pleased to 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 help you help or to 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 try to explain all, all the things i try to share my my presentation and uh, all my 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 colleagues explain clearly what is the do you see now yeah perfect. yeah all my colleagues explain me explain us what is the the covid vaccine uh, at this moment, who is the, the immunity system. And then the other problem is the, the, the manufacturing of this kind of vaccines. Uh, at this moment, there is a lot of uh, strategies, I, I, I say, the, the, to obtain different vaccine types, and they have different uh, manufacturing times. In the, in the COVID-19, there is a, a new record. The first record was the, the Ebola vaccine that was in uh, five years to, to do the, 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 the vaccine. And in this case, the, the small scale production was uh, increased scale production and commercial scale production. To reduce all the time on the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was to uh, solate the different phase in the, in the time. And at the same time is to reduce the small scale production and jump directly to commercial scale production in order to ensure that there is enough vaccine to do the, the large scale trials. Because in this case, this, this vaccine was uh, more easy to, to get because there is very easy to, to collect, to recruit the volunteers to, to do that. With this uh, part, there is uh, different manufacturing issues. What this manufacturing issues was really uh, different parts. The main part is the people. When you start with, with all of this, you need to have enough material, enough installation, and of course, training people. And the most uh, issue in the, in the manufacturing is to get this uh, training people. At this moment, we, we increase uh, our, our, our workers in, in a lot because we need to, to prepare for the next, the next, uh, the next steps. The other side is that the, the characteristic of this kind of manufacturing is very specific, very sensible to, to different new technologies, and then it's very difficult to start of the near uh, people or the people with any, 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 any training before, and then we need uh, prep, uh, training people to do all the, all, the, all the different parts, like a single use you see here, or the, the, the chromatography system. In this case, the chromatography system and the and the different different system to 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 purify all these uh, proteins in the in the vaccine in the kind of of the protein vaccines and the single use system is necessary to to do uh, a, a non material to ensure that we can continue with that. What this means that the that the companies that that manufacturing the resins or manufacturing the plastic or manufacturing the single use bags or manufacturing all the components of the different parts of the of the production of the of the of the vaccine was uh, over pressure like an like an like a, the the manufacturing com manufacturing companies, and then in this they have a lot of problems to get the not quantity of of resin, the not quantity of plastic, the not quantity of different things to, to need to, to, to cover all that. This is this means that if you are not a, a COVID manufacturer and you need single use bags, may is a sample, is an example, you need a lot of time to re, to, to to obtain these bags because all the factories, all the all the providers was centered in to serve to the COVID manufacturers in order to ensure that the this time that we 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 talk about to reduce this time to, to obtain in the market the vaccine may be easy to do that for all the all the manufacturers. There is a lot of a lot of things to, to change in the in in a, in a, 
there is a lot of things to change in a, in a, in a manufacturing plan in order to ensure that you are uh, in the best way to, to attain that. And then this thing to change is different parts is to, to avoid the, 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 the other part that is not clear to, to have the, the supply of the different suppliers. And uh, all, the, all the materials that you see here, you need batch per batch each week. If you have uh, eight batches per week, then you need eight uh, different parts of this batch per week. In this case, the, the, the stress of the, of the logistical team was totally crazy. The stress of the financial team is more crazy than, than the logistical because all this material is so expensive. And then you have a big quantity of stock of this material in order to ensure that you can continue batch per batch, week per week, month per month, in order to ensure that there is a continued drug system uh, production of that. Uh, simple things like uh, C-Flex uh, or Advantaflex uh, uh, silicone rubber, uh, you have a lot of problems to get that. And then you need to spend one kilometer of this, uh, this C-Flex per week and then, or per month, sorry, and then it's a lot of quantity of consumables to, to, to use that. The other issue, like uh, the people, is the, the clothes. It's, it's, a, it's a joke, but really the clothes is so difficult to to, to get it easy and to spend a lot of uh, quantity of these clothes to do that. We are working to do different different strategies to, to avoid that, and we can work with another providers to, to use another kinds of, of clothes that, that we are talking about. And sometimes in, in, in all the parts, there is a validation system that is necessary to, to, to maintain all the consistency batch per batch in this kind of, of vaccines. This means that the, all the all the equipment may be recalibrated, all the equipment may be revalidated, all the equipment may be tested with uh, with a media test in order to ensure that all the process is in correct way. This this means that you can introduce a, a lot of engineering runs before to start with the with the with the GMP runs of the of this kind of, of vaccines. And in this point, the training of the people is so 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 difficult and so so uh, stressful that maybe uh, a lot of situation of very stress of the of the people involved in that in the in the meantime all the all the all the providers was the the stress to to serve clearly week per week all the material that we need in order to ensure that we can continue with that what this mean that this mean that all the material you see here is changed batch per watch in order to ensure that there is not cross contamination of that. In this part, you can see different different parts. You can see a, a chromatography system that is the, the last stage of the of the drug system because you start with 900 or 2000 uh, liter vessel in order to do a, a, a bioprocess of the different kind of cells, depending on the vaccine that you need to obtain. As our mates say, there is a different kind of vaccines. In our case, we are centered in, in two kinds of vaccines, one of uh, DNA vaccine and one of uh, protein subunits uh, vaccine. What does this mean, the protein subunit vaccines? That you need to, to introduce in the vaccine the most purified protein that you can do. And this is the last step of that, is to use different chromatography uh, steps to, to obtain that. These different chromatography steps may be an exclusion chromatography, a molecular size chromatography, and affinity chromatography in order to ensure that the purification of that is very, very clear. What this means too, that in, if you start with 2,000 liters uh, bioreactor to, to do 2,000 liters of uh, antigen, when you purify all of that, you only obtain four or 10 uh, liters of drug system. This thing, of, this four, four to ten liters of drug system, is determined is the determine the, the the quantity that you can introduce in the vaccine. In the vaccine, that as as our mate said before, need an adjuvant and need a different specific buffers to to do the the immunologic reaction clearly to maintain this immunological uh, oh, sorry this immunological reaction. All of this uh, in this in this kind of vaccines may be due at the final of the phase three, 
and maybe clearly to 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 think clear what is the the steps to do what is the process to do clearly but in this case the the the, ne the necessary uh, vaccine in the in the market in the market do that the all the all the parameters that you need one month two months to to take it clear maybe reducing days or sometimes in hours because you need to do all the system uh, mainly to to do this this kind of vaccines um uh, this is um, uh, our uh, specific uses like uh, manufacturing. There is another problems like uh, like uh, the the refrigeration units. If you have a vaccine that you need, you need to have uh, minus 80 degrees. You have a lot of uh, uh, freezers to to obtain this 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 temperature and to maintain the stock of this drug system. If your vaccine is in the final product to different temperature or less temperature than this, there is a lot of problems to, to maintain that. Then the, the main issues now in the in the in this in this world is to 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 have uh, good partners in the supply of single use system and to maintain these good partners in order to ensure not the, the actual uh, supply, might the future supply because you cannot stop with the with the with the vaccine really and then uh, for my side thank you to the to the organization of that and and come back when whenever you want thank you very much uh, adolfo for addressing all these uh, very relevant issues and now uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give the floor to uh, sol ruiz who will be discussing on the more regulatory aspects of vaccines. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Francesc, and thanks to uh, the organization for inviting me to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to share my presentation. Hopefully it's OK. Can you see it well, please, if you can? Is it OK? Okay, um, so again, thank you so much. In the next few minutes, I will try to uh, just review very briefly uh, some of the regulatory aspects regarding uh, vaccines. Oh, I cannot see the presentation. Let me see. Um, um, share a screen. Apologies. Coming, coming. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So apologies. So yeah, uh, very briefly, some of the regulatory aspects regarding vaccines and also what um, new um, um, procedures have been put in place in order to speed up the availability of uh, vaccines against COVID. So uh, first, uh, I mean, there's a large experience already in the European Union in the evaluation of marketing authorizations for vaccines. So there are more than 40 authorized through different uh, marketing authorization procedures. So some are regular marketing authorizations, such as, uh, for instance, for influenza vaccines, hepatitis B. There are some others that got a conditional marketing authorization or what is called exceptional circumstances, for instance, for the Ebola vaccines. The first one was authorized under conditional marketing authorization, the second under exceptional circumstances. I'm not going to go into details because it would take long. And there's also a smallpox vaccine uh, approved under exceptional circumstances. So this is just a list so you can see uh, <clears throat> At, uh, at currently how many vaccines are available in the EU. As you can see, some are monocomponent, uh, multiple components, some are combined vaccines, as you can see, including, for instance, antigens for hepatitis B, tetanus, uh, meningitis, etc. So when we go to regulatory uh, documents, uh, there are many, again, because the experience is, is large. So if you go to the EMA website, you can already find under vaccines, 
many guidelines and other documents. Some are general, as you can see, for quality, non-clinical and clinical aspects. Other are specific, like for instance, um, adjuvants uh, for use in, in vaccines, and also quite a number of European pharmacopoeia texts. Of course, their requirements are going to be different depending on the type of vaccine and um, depending on the antigen, depending on the disease, etc. And as you can see, this is also an example of how many guidelines there are, are available uh, regarding also manufacturing um, requirements or uh, clinical evaluation of new vaccines. So this is one of the main documents, a clinical evaluation of new vaccines. We're not going to go into the details, but this is just to show you if you're interested in, in the document. And uh, more specifically regarding COVID-19 vaccines, uh, as you can see, most of them will be evaluated through the system that we call the centralized procedure that involves, um, it's coordinated by the European Medicines Agency and, and all the um, national agencies are involved. And uh, again, the main documents, as you can see, are the guideline on clinical evaluation of vaccines, but also it's been uh, developed another document with specific considerations on COVID-19. Um, this has been shown by some of my uh, colleagues in the previous talk, so very quickly, this is the uh, this figure illustrates the normal development of uh, any vaccine regarding, you know, development of uh, uh, the prototype of vaccine, pharmaceutical quality, then non-clinical studies, both the in vitro and in vivo, then um, clinical trials, uh, different phases of clinical trials. Then when all that is being completed, there is an evaluation and decision first by the EMA and then by the European Commission and then scale up production and post-marketing uh, evaluation uh, follow. So this would be like a normal development uh, for a regular vaccine. So as you can see, it's sort of a staggered approach. You start with the quality, non-clinical, and then you go through the different uh, phases uh, for clinical development. For the COVID-19 vaccines, all these phases are kind of happening at the same time, and this has also been mentioned. So pharmaceutical quality is kind of developed almost at the same time as the non-clinical research and also as the clinical studies. And what we have seen is that phase one, two, and three, there's uh, maybe no such uh, separation as we have seen for regular developments, but they are sort of overlapping. So this allows um, the, the availability of data uh, sooner. So why this has been possible for COVID-19, and we saw in the first presentation how fast the development had been. Well, first, we already have experience on manufacturing vaccines using similar platforms. Then we have uh, also many years of previous non-clinical and clinical research also using um, related viruses such as uh, uh, SARS, MERS, Ebola, malaria. Also very important, there was uh, enormous funding that, that allowed multiple trials in parallel and scaling up of production during clinical development. Also, we had a worldwide uh, pandemic that has uh, facilitated uh, large efficacy clinical trials. And then we have allowed like a regulatory flexibility based on previous knowledge, allowing faster evaluation procedures. So regarding quality requirements, so you can see that for regular vaccines and for COVID-19 vaccines, their requirements are the same and the same standard supply, although with some flexibility on some of the areas. Regarding the development, we have seen that uh, all the phases sort of overlapped, so that has allowed um, vaccines available sooner. Resources, both from companies and from the regulatory side, have been mobilized to have uh, quicker evaluation times. Regarding dialogue, this was something that started very early with uh, the first um, vaccine uh, vaccines being developed. So there was a very 
um, frequent interaction between developers and the EME, EMA in order to facilitate uh, the, the, the development and, and to be more efficient into the studies that were needed for evaluation. Uh, regarding manufacturing, again, the capacity to uh, scale up has been much faster than what we have seen normally. And regarding the evaluation, um, there's been also an important uh, group within the EMA, as you can see here highlighted in yellow, that is called the EMA Pandemic Task Force. And this has been a group with very frequent uh, meetings, assessing all the available evidence that was being generated, having, again, frequent meetings with um, uh, developers and companies to allow uh, the process to be uh, much faster. So in this uh, task force, I mean, we're lucky the Spanish uh, Medicines Agency has three representatives. So yeah, we're well uh, present there. And again, we're not going into details, but this is the guideline in case you're interested in, regarding considerations on COVID-19 vaccine approval. And Again, all the procedures have been made very flexible and very quick regarding scientific advice uh, for rapid development, um, rapid agreement on a pediatric investigation plan, what is called rolling review that we will see in the next slide, uh, marketing authorization and uh, uh, opinions on compassionate use if uh, needed. Just as an illustration, you can see that uh, many COVID-19 medicines, both vaccines and other medicines, have received advice from the EMA, including antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, other immunomodulators, etc. And what is a rolling review? So this is a procedure that allows um, the review of the data as they become available without an official marketing authorization application. So as evidence was being generated with the different vaccines, this was assessed. And then when more or less the whole package was complete, was that was when companies would apply for marketing authorization application. So this is the process. We are not going to go into the details, but again, in the last bullet point, you can see that once the data package is complete, the developer submits a formal marketing authorization application. There are also procedures that have been applied for other medicines, what is called accelerated assessment with the reduced in time for evaluation. And also we have other tools that are being applied such as conditional marketing authorization that is granted when the benefit risk is positive and is allowed with a specific obligations so the companies can present information post-marketing. If you go to the EMA website, you can see uh, that all the news regarding COVID-19, either starting of rolling reviews, marketing authorization applications, authorizations are um, uh, there. And you can see, uh, again, if you go, uh, even if you go today, also, for instance, there's uh, news about a public meeting in March that you can sign for regarding all the COVID vaccines. So the information there is updated very uh, timely. Also, just uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but if you're interested, the website of the Spanish Medicines Agency has also a lot of information regarding uh, vaccines and other medicines for COVID-19 and what are the different steps. And also very important, um, yeah, the pharmacovigilance of vaccines that, uh, you know, will take place once uh, these vaccines are um, authorized and will make sure that, uh, you know, they, uh, the, the safety profile is in line with what was seen in the clinical development phase. With this, thank you very much for your attention and, and happy to continue with the questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sol. And I think that now we are going to move uh, to the other side of the Atlantic uh, for the presentation of Philippe Alexander uh, Gilbert from the Gates Foundation. And following that, we will start with questions and answers. So, Philippe Alexander, thank you for joining your time. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to start sharing my presentation. And please let me know if yep. uh, you see it. Yep. Yes. All right. 
Perfect. So um, thank you very much for the uh, organizer for uh, the invite. It's always a privilege to uh, attend those um, uh, uh, presentation and also be able to uh, convey the foundation, the the Gate Foundation uh, goals. So I'm going to be presenting very rapidly some um, uh, thoughts on the mRNA vaccine manufacturing for low medium income countries. And um, uh, just briefly, I'm a vaccine expert. I've been in the vaccine field for about 20 years for a different company like Medimmune Vaccine, Novartis Vaccine, GSK Vaccine, and Sanofi Pasteur, and just joined the foundation as a program officer in the CMC division. Um, so uh, the foundation has been uh, involved uh, extremely rapidly in the um, uh, COVID-19 situation in terms of uh, developing a tool called COVAX uh, to uh, make sure that we would uh, distribute some uh, vaccines to the low, medium income countries. I think it's safe to say that if we don't resolve the, the COVID as um, uh, at the scale of um, the planet, we won't be able to solve the COVID at all. So uh, we have uh, good news. As of yesterday, we were able to deliver our first um, uh, vaccine in the low medium income country. This is the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, around 600,000 uh, doses were distributed. And uh, this was produced by the Serum Institute of uh, India. Uh, so this is just a first step. And uh, we see uh, the foundation is working with this partner like CP, Gavi, the World uh, WHO to be able to um, uh, distribute these vaccines. So uh, despite this, the situation is not uh, uh, bright for uh, COVID in the low medium income country, as you can see, and, and this was like covered by Julia in the first uh, presentation. Uh, there's still a very low percentage of uh, vaccines in the low medium income country, if not uh, zero. And uh, this is obviously based on the fact that there's been uh, some um, issues related to vaccine nationalism, uh, production, uh, and also um, uh, a scale of um, the entire um, the candidate uh, portfolio. So um, uh, at the foundation, we've been extremely uh, intrigued and interested by the mRNA vaccine success. And uh, obviously, we've been asking ourselves what would have been the low medium income country situation with uh, a platform like this giving uh, such advantages in terms of speed, uh, possibly uh, standardization and also like small footprint. And obviously the very successful potency that we've seen. So obviously that would have been uh, quite uh, a tool to have in our uh, campaign for the low medium income country. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do in the next few slides is just present like some uh, high level thoughts on the mRNA platform. And some some of these, um, uh, this is like general information, but uh, I think that's going to help you understand where we're uh, where we're going in terms of the foundation and what, what we're thinking. So obviously, the the mRNA uh, LMP um, platform is extremely uh, elegant. Uh, I would say it's a more uh, chemical process than a biological process per se. It relies on few uh, raw materials such as lipids, cholesterol, cationic lipids, uh, polyethylene uh, glycol, phospholipids, and also a set of reagents to be able to produce an mRNA in terms of the in vitro transcription reagents, post-transcriptional modification, and then template degradation, the DNA de degradation. So um, uh, the mRNA methods, I won't go too much into detail because we have the limited time, but obviously it relies on those key reagents. There's some IP on specific key reagents that uh, obviously are, uh, um, uh, make this uh, technology not necessarily available for low, medium income country, but we, we're going to need to find a way to um, de uh, deal with this. And also there's a specific set of methods for drug substance production and drug product formulation. Uh, but overall, I would uh, qualify this uh, method of production uh, as simple compared to a biological process. So basically, there are some advantages maybe in terms of being able to tech transfer that to the low medium income country. And um, uh, in the past few months, we've also seen like uh, supply chain space being established around those mRNA platform owners. And then uh, there's been uh, obviously like a couple of pharma part partners and pharma helpers have been uh, tagging along with those mRNA platform owners. Um, there's also a distribution of CMOs, uh, contract manufacturing organization for drug substance and drug product has been set up. And obviously, um, uh, lipid supplier, mRNA, enzymes, material supply. 
supplier and other type of raw material supplier. In certain cases, they're also special technology supplier for uh, specific needs of the mRNA platform. Um, so in terms of uh, cost of goods, obviously that's our main uh, focus for the low, medium and con country. Um, it, it's relatively encouraging. So you see uh, in the red line here, I'm sorry, the, the site is um, uh, very, very small here, but uh, you can see highlighted uh, the main uh, mRNA um, players, Moderna, CureVac and Pfizer. And they're already broadcasting uh, prices that are relatively uh, low for high in income country. And uh, in the case of Pfizer, there's already like cases where the price uh, broadcasted for low medium income countries around five or six dollars. So this is relatively encouraging in the fact that we could maybe release, um, uh, reduce the price even more in the future, which would make it affordable for low medium income country. Um, so, and finally, one of the main um, weaknesses of the platform is uh, uh, from a low, medium and concrete point of view is the cold chain. And you probably uh, um, learn or uh, read about this platform in terms of uh, having to rely on the ultra cold temperature, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, uh, in the case of Pfizer, minus 70. Uh, there's been like a news, uh, I think a few days ago that Pfizer now uh, has uh, received approval to also operate at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So there is some improvement, but obviously for low medium income country, uh, we need to work in the range of uh, four degrees Celsius or either, uh, even a room temperature if needed. So th there's gonna be some uh, improvement needed for this. So in, con in conclusion, uh, what we're thinking in the foundation is that we would like to address this problem uh, to make this available for low medium country in, in, in the three pillars. Obviously low cost of goods. So um, our goal is really to reduce that and this is gonna be done through a series of uh, a new uh, supply chain. Uh, and so we can really reduce the uh, build uh, $1. Uh, also scale, uh, there's been uh, very good progress in terms of million of doses, and that, that might be interesting for the foundation, not only for COVID, but also for other disease. And that brings the question of the uh, portable environment. But we're gonna also have to uh, work on the pandemic side and, and billion of doses. And actually uh, the bottleneck here might not be the technology itself, but, uh, but the form and fill in terms of finding the right container at a billion doses to do that. And that might introduce uh, new technologies such as a uh, plastic container, uh, blow field seal. And finally, the cold chain, thermal stable, either liquid or lyo. Uh, so we can uh, work in the range of the low, medium and concrete between the refrigerated uh, form up to uh, maybe uh, 25, 40 degrees Celsius if uh, lyo is needed in that case. So I uh, just want to um, uh, thank the organizer again, and then obviously I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of, of this session. Thank you. Good. Thank you, uh, Philip Alexander, and, and thank you to to all uh, all the speakers in the in the session. Uh, I think is uh, is now the time to start addressing some of the uh, some of the questions we already had. We had questions already in the um, uh, uh, that were coming during your presentations that I will try to to, to group a little bit. So there is, there is uh, a group of questions related to the. Uh, the quality of of, of, the, of the vaccines and of the also how the clinical trials uh, have been addressed. So one of the first questions we had is that if there was a placebo COVID vaccine that is administered at the same time of other COVID vaccines uh, uh, trials um, for in fact testing the results of uh, immunology of the population. Uh, and I think that this is also uh, we had twice this uh, this question. Yeah, if there is a group of uh, um, not in the clinical test, I understand, but in the real uh, vaccination, that there is still a placebo vaccine uh, being used. I think that I know the answer, but I would like to to get your answer. So I don't know if who would like to answer this question, <laughs> uh, Julia or Margarita or Paul. I think, I mean, obviously during the clinical development, uh, yeah, yeah, you need a placebo arm or a control arm 
you know, even if it's not a placebo, uh, to, to test that your product or in this particular case, the, the vaccine is working and protecting against the specific disease. Obviously, once the vaccine is authorized, it's no longer used. So. And for the new, uh, this is uh, is connecting to a second question, uh, asking that if for the new vaccines in development, they will be compared to those already, uh, uh, you know, approved, or uh, or uh, they will be against something else. So this is a discussion that is ongoing already. I mean, among the regulators, and and uh, I forgot to mention also that there is also very. Um, there's a, a exchange and discussions with uh, other regulatory agencies such as the FDA, Health Canada, Japanese, uh, WHO, in order to harmonize. But this is a discussion that we're having. I mean, obviously, the situation when more people are getting vaccinated, we realize that it's not going to be so easy to do uh, studies to see protective efficacy because maybe the circulation of the virus is going to be more restricted so we understand those limitations so we will have to be a little bit creative we don't know if there will be at some point a good correlate of protection that uh, then you know would make easier to to assess new vaccines or maybe yeah in comparison to uh, an already authorized vaccine so those things i mean are are still in the discussion nothing is being uh, decided yet but is discussed not only not only in the european union but also again globally with other regulators and who thanks yeah so, maybe if i can add something it's what for example what happened with the astrazeneca also the the vaccine that it, it was said that it's not that it's not safety or efficacy for elderly people or for younger one, but they they didn't have enough enough people to to test this. Now they are doing more and more, but I mean they didn't have so that's the reason they closed the 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 age no between 18 and 65 in some cases 55 in in Spain for example, but that doesn't mean that if a uh, is someone from 65 it's it's received this vaccine it's gonna have uh, happen something with uh, mm -hmm. with him or her so but but that's true that depending on the area or hopefully more and more we will have less volunteers because we will have less less patients also so um, this this will lower the number of volunteers for sure so this may be uh, uh, links to another question uh, for uh, for Seoul. Uh, there is a specific question: uh, Why this time the, there was uh, the the um, let's say the approval or the permission of commercialization right after the approval, uh, when normally there is like a one year delay to get into the market access? I think that also yeah. has for that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, again, uh, one of the reasons is like there was a lot of funding. I mean, governments, and you have heard in the news everywhere, uh, were already um, committing uh, to buy a large number of doses. So uh, with that um, sort of um, economic resources, companies could start um, scaling up manufacturing sooner. So normally that is done after you get the marketing authorization. So in this case, this scaling up was happening already at the time of evaluation and clinical development. So by the time the, the vaccine was authorized, uh, large manufacturing scale was already in place. So um, this is something that it doesn't happen normally, but in this case, again, the resources were put first, so this uh, would be possible um, as soon as the marketing authorization was granted. Since uh, Sol, you mentioned about manufacturing, maybe this links to one of the questions that I think Adolfo could address. Uh, there was a specific question uh, if it is not possible to regenerate the chromatographic material by intensive uh, washing. Uh, yes, yes, it's possible. It's possible, but uh, I, 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 I be a mistake in the presentation because I say that all surround of the chromatography system may be changed batch per batch. Obviously, the resin is more critical to change because you you can uh, packet packet it uh, each more or less 
uh, any numbers of, of cycles or lot or batches, but not uh, chain by batch per batch because you can spend a lot of time to do that. And then is washing and sanitization and a sanitization after two. I'm sorry, maybe, maybe a mistake in the in the presentation, really. Thank you, Adolfo. Maybe a still a follow up on manufacturing issues. One for uh, Philippe Alexander. Uh, you got the, a question if you could uh, give some uh, names of suppliers or producers for uh, uh, RNA enzymes and, and lipids uh, needed for RNA vaccines. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. And, uh, and obviously, um, that uh, depends on the mRNA supplier. Uh, before I answer, just a uh, uh, comment that these are common um, material. So it's not a common situation and, and the supply chain was not there, but eventually these will become common material and then we're gonna have a, a very good supply and that should help the cost of good. In terms of uh, mRNA enzyme, um, obviously the, there is a different type of supplier uh, that are uh, associated to the mRNA uh, owners like uh, Thermo Fisher, uh, there's also uh, Trilink, uh, there's a different type of companies like really uh, specialize on those type of enzymes that are common enzymes. And uh, in terms of lipids, uh, it's a little bit more of a difficult environment because they're a little bit more IP uh, around the lipids. But uh, you're going to hear names like Aquitas uh, a lot, which was uh, uh, very uh, specialized in this. A Aventi Polar, that also like produce a lot of the uh, lipid needed for this type of technology. And also, you, you have like big acquisition uh, occurring right now, like uh, Croda. Uh, that has uh, acquired the Venti uh, a few months ago. So uh, it's a uh, it's a evolving uh, space right now. Thank you. And I think that now we are going to get into some of the questions related to the um, the type of uh, vaccines and effects and vaccinations. I think uh, Margarita, you were uh, triggering some uh, questions on uh, how how long we will need to. Mm -hmm way to develop vaccines that could protect both against infections and infection and transmission? I really have no idea. Uh, sometimes it is a good design and sometimes it is also luck that you get a good uh, protection from infection and therefore from transmission. Uh, the good thing is that if you are going to try intranasal immunization, uh, you may be able, the chances that you get a good uh, local immunity, local memory immunity, and therefore protection from infection in the, in the nasopharynx are higher. But of course, maybe Sol can comment on that. There is not that much um, precedence on uh, intranasal inoculation, and that's also not so, not so easy to, to judge from a regulatory side. No, you're, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, um, yeah, we don't have uh, many examples. And um, but I mean, yeah, if someone would decide to go for that, obviously we're we're open. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah, it's not not a lot not a lot of experience using that route. Mm -hmm. yeah. A follow up question on 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 this issue is that when we are talking about uh, less effective uh, RNA vaccines, is this related that the 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 quantity of the uh, immunity is lower or the quality of the vaccines are giving a better uh, immunity or better quality immune, immunity. So it is about quantity or quality at the end. I am not fully sure. If you have more antibodies, uh, probably it means that you also have a, a higher degree of cellular immunity because in general they go together. Uh, but the quality could be different, and uh, uh, that's why it, it is important to know what is the what are the correlates of protection. I understand uh, the way I see it, but I, there's no proof of that at all. That for this virus, we need a combination of both antibodies and cellular immunity. That is different for different viruses. For those viruses uh, which spend most of their life as free particles, you need huge amounts of antibodies. For those viruses that have spent most of their lives in infected cells and there's little virus released in the extracellular space, you need much more of uh, cellular immunity for viruses or for bacteria or for parasites. 
you need more cellular immunity. I would say this virus is going to require a mixture of both, and uh, we will have to find out which is the the right uh, the right um, uh, kind of ingredients we know we need for for for, for having the best protection. Uh, it will be important to compare what is the degree of immunity of all types of immunity conferred by AstraZeneca, by Janssen, by the mRNA vaccines. Compare them and see what is missing in one that is uh, present at high amounts in the other one. And maybe that could give us some clues as to what is uh, conferring more protection. Anyway, I want to emphasize that a vaccine like AstraZeneca that has a smaller number, like 60 instead of 95, it means that it's going to protect uh, most of the people uh, to the same extent as the, as the Pfizer vaccine, only there will be more people with symptoms. But it will protect from death and severe cases as well. So there's no disadvantage in getting that vaccine because you may have some symptoms, but there's nothing compared with the, with the awful stress of uh, uh, intensive care units, hospitalization for long times, death and so on. Yeah, I totally agree with, with Margarita. And if I can add something that's true, that there is a correlation on neutralizing antibodies, no? and this is maybe the, I, I won't say the standard or the gold standard technique, but that's true, no? it's the first technique, or for example, with the um, volunteers or patients vaccinated, uh, this is the correlation we, we have nowadays, no? to check, for example, if it's gonna cross protect against other variants, but that's true that this is not the only thing. For sure, cell immunity has something to say. And this is one of my questions, uh, if you remember on the last slide, no? This is one of the hot topics, which is the correlation of uh, immunity and protection. So we need to really uh, know exactly this to, to say in vitro, no? How, how to proceed. But for example, it's true that when we do experiments uh, in vivo, there is a clear correlation. If, uh, if the animals cannot develop neutralizing antibodies, they are not going to be protected against the disease. So this is a correlation. Mm -hmm. We still have another another very detailed, very specific maybe question on, 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 the, on, the, on the use of vaccines. And this is people who had uh, symptoms uh, with the flu vaccines, um, like receiving a shot of a flu vaccine because they have a compromised immune system. Um, could they have problems receiving the COVID vaccines? Maybe this is more a question for an MD, but um, I don't it's know. If safety. 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 Well, it is, it, it is clear, at least for, so for Pfizer, for AstraZeneca, for Moderna, that the, the good thing is that they don't use a uh, live virus. So this is not uh, risky. So some, sometimes people think about other typical traditional vaccines, mums, or that they use uh, a live virus. So it's quite risky for immunocompromised people. These are demonstrated not to be risky. Of course, if you have some symptoms, as uh, so this is uh, reported there, eh? uh, several people after receiving the first dose and especially the second dose, they have. Uh, some some uh, adverse effects such as fever, such as pain, uh, inflammation in the zone. But this uh, last one to two days, so this is normal. But for this, at least for these three vaccines, and I'm for sure for other because they are using these strategies or for the protein-based vaccines, uh, they are not uh, risky for immunocompromised people in the terms that they are not using the the live virus. The other thing is th if this Immuno, uh, immunosuppressed or immunocompromised uh, people if they are uh, getting the same level of protection or not. But still, for sure, they will uh, have some protection. So maybe they are not reaching the same efficacy as the, the non-immunocompromised people, but they will have some protection for sure. And, and maybe uh, to, uh, one quick comment uh, about the last question and, and, and this question uh, is, uh, we see there's a lot we don't know about mRNA. It's a new platform, and uh, I think it's been designed with uh, uh, and a very um, uh, safe spectrum with uh, two dose, high quantity. So what you see works better. But uh, then the question is, can we only make it work with only one dose? 
And then uh, in terms of uh, anything related to flu, it's also a good question because then the next question will be uh, what's, what's going to happen with flu and uh, are we going to need uh, flu COVID vaccine in the future? Yep. Um, a specific question for Margarita uh, is this um, sort of uh, uh, follow-up of uh, uh, the, uh, the spread of the uh, pandemics in the workplace or out of the workplace? If Do you think that uh, occup occupational risk prevention uh, uh, teams could have play a, a better role in preventing the spread of COVID? I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't have data for that. But my feeling is that in those places where people know each other, where people meet the same the same type of people every day, like at work or any or at uh, at school or at the university or any other type of regulated activity, control of the pandemic is much better than whenever we do something spontaneously and we take our masks off. And then there's less control and we don't know the other people, so we never can trace where the infection came from. So tracing is not so exhaustive anymore in, 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 the, in, the, in the countries we all come from because we have a lot of cases. So it's, uh, very few cases are really traced and so it is really difficult to know where the infection comes from. At the workplace, you usually know if you got infected from uh, um, a colleague because uh, because you know you meet each other and, and and that can be traced and there's little infection in those cases so workplaces are really quite safe and this is linked to another question we just got uh, very very few minutes ago is about uh, what could be the potential side effects or maybe also in the in the long term of of use of uh, of of this new type of vaccines Difficult to answer. <laughs> I think I think I have I, I have no idea, but I have a comment. Is that uh, never in in history have have we had such a synchronous uh, vaccination of so many people at the same time? So if there's a rare effect that comes uh, uh, as a late uh, effect later in time, maybe in one year time, we should be able to see it maybe for the first time in history. I don't know if you agree, so yeah. No, fully agree with you, Margarita. I mean, but this happens with every vaccine. I mean, if there is something that, uh, yeah, happens with a very, very low frequency, you only see it after, you know, years after. But again, um, what we know from the platforms that we are already using is that, um, you know, they, they seem quite safe and you know regarding also the components in the in the vaccines but again uh, but this can happen with any medicines obviously vaccines are administered to a very large number of people but uh, you know with any medicines once it gets into the market and then after you know uh, hundreds or mil thousands or millions are exposed is when you see very rare adverse events that would be very difficult to 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 to, to think about them now at the current time, yeah. We are coming almost to the end of our time, so I will grab maybe one or two last questions. There's one for uh, for Philippe Alexander uh, directly asking how many vaccines the foundation is supporting and how many are in phase uh, three or approved stages and what is the money invested? So you got three questions in one. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I'll answer very quickly. Um, so uh, first of all, um, the COVID, uh, we were not supposed to um, take care of COVID. Uh, that's not our focus, but uh, we were forced to because the attack on low medium income country was uh, horrible. Uh, and that uh, I think people underestimate the fact that it disrupted all the other vaccine campaigns. And so now we, we're five years back in all the gains we uh, did. So the foundation is supporting a lot of uh, diseases. We're talking about a portfolio of like uh, 15 to 20 diseases, especially focusing on um, infant uh, in low medium income country. And uh, our unit is measure is uh, how many lives uh, we can save. And uh, in terms of phase three, uh, we, ha we have a couple of these. Uh, it's also a question of um, uh, making those uh, available um, the vaccines already available in the market 
uh, more uh, affordable, but also uh, more um, uh, um, accommodated to the need. So in terms of thermal stability, um, also a different type of format in terms of uh, distribution and also access. And the money invested, I would really encourage you to go to the foundation website and uh, you have all this information, but we're investing around $5 billion per year. Uh, thank you. And last by, but not mm -hmm. least, I will mm -hmm. pick as a last question, the first one we, we got in the chat. So I think probably the people asking the question is thinking why uh, his question was not coming uh, in, the, in, the, in the discussion. And this is about uh, big data. Uh, is big data uh, like to be, uh, you know, play a role in the development of vaccines? I, I think so. I mean, uh, again, uh, one of the reasons uh, why we have had such a rapid development is because, uh, yeah, there were uh, already the same platforms were being used for other diseases such as SARS, MERS, uh, Zika, even HIV. So um, uh, obviously the, the amount of knowledge also that we are going to generate with this massive vaccination worldwide with different vaccines based on different platforms, I, I think it's going to be, you know, very, very useful for uh, future development. So th this is going to be really good. And yeah, uh, that's what we are using also for, for this uh, mm -hmm. rapid development. Yeah, thanks. So thank you. I have to admit I had uh, a list of backup questions that I would be very much uh, tempted to to start uh, uh, asking, but I think that our time is over. So I would like to uh, conclude with this uh, webinar, first by thanking all our speakers to uh, keep the time to deliver, uh, I think, very interesting uh, uh, messages and information uh, in from their own uh, particular uh, expertise that were complementary one to, uh, to each other. So thank you very much for, for spending some of your precious time with us uh, today. And also thank you to the audience that uh, also followed. Uh, we have received already some uh, uh, comments uh, uh, positive from, from the audience that was, uh, was following the webinar. And, and just follow with the uh, series of the webinars of uh, Expokimia Bio. Also, thank you very much for to FIRA Barcelona and Expokimia to having this initiative of, uh, you know, uh, still uh, putting a platform to keep uh, people uh, together in this uh, in this virtual time and of communications that we have uh, to uh, to live. But thanks to vaccines, this will go over. Uh, hopefully in a few months. So thank you again. Uh, I close the webinar here. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so thank much for the invitation. Bye-bye.